live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Wow, hey, good morning everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, October 14th, 2019. Time for yet another show. How's everybody doing today? I, uh, uh, you know, I'm okay. I uh, hit the wrong button to get the show started and that was kind of annoying. And uh, I found out just hitting the wrong button again doesn't actually turn off the mistake that you made. So we just jumped into uh, touching the right button and that seemed to have done the trick. Okay, sort of a nice... Uh, feature of the app that I learned about eight years into using it. That's nice. I guess that means I've never made that mistake before, which is amazing. All right. It is Monday. It is a holiday for government uh, around, uh, well, at least our county government. Is closed. I think the federal government is closed today, too, which is a real puzzle because it is, of course, a very controversial uh, holiday. Thanksgiving in Canada so, you know, uh, we are all upset here about the continuation of the uh, Canadian Thanksgiving tradition. And the United States government really has no business closing for Thanksgiving Day in Canada. But, uh, you know, it's a lot better than the other holiday that they used to have. It's a, it's a nice excuse. I mean, to be polite to our neighbors, right? Uh, is it a government closure in Canada? I would assume so, right? That seems like a good day to have off. And uh, we'll just celebrate it that way uh, until we all settle on a uh, consensus for what to do with this remaining holiday. Everybody wants the day off, but uh, increasingly unpopular to celebrate it as, you know, that day. And I've seen it, uh, I've seen it offered up as an Indigenous Peoples Day here in the United States. Hasn't quite caught on. It should. It may take some time. But, uh, all right, well, we haven't really adopted that as a standard here. In other words, my calendar doesn't say it, and that is the standard by which I judge these things. So happy Thanksgiving to our Canadian friends, and we'll all thank uh, you for the opportunity right? we'll, we'll, for, to, to uh, use that as the holiday instead. It is uh, government closure here. Uh, I am aware of this only because I have uh, some business to transact with the county government, and I thought today would be a great day to do it. But uh, it isn't. It's a terrible day to do it. Uh, great for me, terrible for them, and therefore terrible for me. That's the way government works these days. Lots to catch up on over the weekend. Uh, also closed today is Greg Dworkin. He's got uh, government business to transact today as well and will not be able to join us. I don't know whether we're going to be able to sneak him in again tomorrow. I think it's, uh, we'll just resume regularly scheduled programming on Wednesday with him and, uh, and we'll be glad of it too. Daily Coast Radio is live now. We are reliably informed from Portland, Maine, site of another of our stories today. Bill tells us, the show being live now, K Grow X, that's somebody I know, uh, allegedly me, and it's uh, known that way in Canada. Anyway, it's broadcasting from a replica of the Santa Maria, hinting at the uh, other holiday we're celebrating today, except not celebrating it. We hear it has a water slider, an excellent buffet, yes. Uh, that comes up every once in a while. Santa Maria, by the way, my favorite of uh, the three ships, only because uh, every time somebody says, uh, lists two items that has both two syllables in them, I usually add the Santa Maria at the end, no matter what the hell they're talking about. And uh, it's a fun thing around our household. Anyway, uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, I mentioned that uh, Maine figured in today's news. If Greg were here, and he's he's around, he's just not calling us today, uh, he would have shared with you this news of a very unusual anti Susan Collins ad that ran in the Press Herald today. Uh, it's very interesting just to look at it and to see what the reaction is. Just, uh, I mean, well, it's pretty straightforward. It's an all print ad, and it says as its headline, Senator Collins, you said I was rude. This this sounds pretty Maine-ish, I guess, to begin with. Uh, On a recent flight from D.C. to Portland, the ad continues, I was happy to see you. I don't know if that's really true, but I was happy to see you in the boarding area. I asked you if I could talk with you and you invited me to sit down. I asked you if you believed that soliciting foreign interference in our elections was a crime and you would not answer. And you could see how this conversation is going to go. And I'm sure that Susan Collins could see how that conversation was going to go. Um, 
what was interesting to it was the reaction, uh, or about it was the reaction to it. Uh, it continues on. It says, uh, I asked you to explain the president's discriminatory language about women. That's a polite way of putting it. Immigrants and people of color to my children. And you lamented the lack of civility in Washington. Which, okay, it's a problem, right? I asked you about Brett Kavanaugh and you would not discuss it. I asked you for your position on impeachment, and you told me you could not comment. Yeah, that's famously her position is, oh, well, I'm going to be on the jury, so to speak, by serving in the Senate. If he's impeached, I will sit as his jury, and I can't comment on a case before it, you know, before it's presented to me. However, of course, uh, well, for one thing, that's not at all how it works. Uh, and for another thing is he uh, or uh, he or she, let me see, there's a name at the bottom and I can't read it because I have to get really close to the screen and then I can tell you uh, my best guess at what the pronoun might be and I could be wrong. But uh, this person, which is the best thing we can say before I get close to the screen here is <clears throat> that I asked you for your position on impeachment, told me you couldn't discuss it. Uh, your colleague, however, Senator King commented in his op-ed piece last week, why can't you? Answer, uh, there's no, no real reason. We parted agreeing to disagree. That sounds very civil. But on the jet bridge, I heard you comment to someone that a constituent had just been very rude to you. It was not my intention to be rude. Uh, it was my intention to have a thoughtful discussion across ideological lines. It was my intention to do the work of a democracy, but you were unwilling to participate in that. Several people on the flight overheard our interaction and thanked me for talking with you. I am still waiting for answers to my questions. They're still waiting, too. Uh, and the ad is paid for by our person here. I got to really I got to this is small type on this screen. Hold on a second. This is a terrible screen. I'm complaining to you, Apple. Eric Mercer. Is that right? Do I have not? Is there no magnifier on this thing? Let me. Uh. Boy, I'm getting old. This is a, the show has to end now. I'm ancient and I can't read anything anymore. This is no better. Uh, really, seriously, I have to stick my face down here. I'm taking off the headphones. I'm getting bifocals. Let's see. Yeah, Eric. Okay, Eric Mercer. Excellent. I got it now, and uh, he's got his address on there. I don't know if we want to necessarily read that out on the air you can find the ad actually uh discussed uh in one of the top recommended diaries over at daily coast we uh have it up available it looks like it was a popular piece so i'm sure you can take a look at the thing in case you can't get a hold of a paper copy of the portland paper interesting reactions to it in the thread that greg sent me through the back channels the secret Russian back channels that the government isn't monitoring. Uh, it came to me via, well, it came to me in a dream. How about that? It came to me via the tweet of Burgess Everett, not Burgess Meredith, but Burgess Everett, Politico congressional reporter. And there's some interesting responses to it, including the response of Matt Whitlock, who purports to be the NRSC, National Republican Senatorial Committee, NRSC senior advisor, Matt Whitlock, who displays some really kind of some stunning uh, entitlement, really, in this. Naturally, Matt says, the person who wrote this donated to Collins's Senate opponent, Sarah Gideon, along with a link to an FEC uh, report that I, I would gather uh, displays that, uh, the evidence of that, uh, that donation. I mean, I, I was just sort of... I, uh, I don't know. I'm not surprised. I guess that would uh, that, that's an easy answer for Matt to give. But of course, what would you expect a person who gets treated like the by that like that by the, their senator to do when it comes time to make their choice about who they're going to support and who they're going to vote for? Obviously, they're going to look for an alternative. Now, I'm sure Matt's point was that they had already made up their mind to vote for Sarah Gideon and probably the date on the, um, the, the donation would make clear that the choice had been made. Although, you know, the vote hasn't been cast and lots of people do play both sides and donate to both major party candidates. That's true. But 
I'm sure the point was uh, this person had long since made up their mind about who they were going to vote for. But once again, uh, enormous confusion uh, intentionally among the Republicans. And, you know, they may not even really truly be confused. They might, in fact, just be uh, playing a game here. But both Senator Collins mistaking a well, reportedly, anyway, I don't really know whether this is a word for word transcript. We don't know that. Right. The president, I, you know, these word for it. I, it was very much like that. I don't know whether those were the exact words that Eric used or the exact words that Senator Collins used. But uh, if it's a pretty good uh, depiction of the conversation, then, of course, pretty typical of sensitive politicians and in particular these days anyway, Republicans to say that that was a rude conversation. That was an extraordinarily civil conversation. It was uncomfortable for Senator Collins because she's on the wrong side of history on every one of those issues, and it's going to cost her her Senate seat, and that's uncomfortable to confront, but it isn't rude to ask those questions. It is, you know, as Eric points out, the function of democracy. We're going to have those conversations, as he says, across ideological lines, which also, by the way, is a pretty clear admission that uh, Eric recognizes that they are on opposite sides of ideological lines. Yes, I know I donated to uh, Senator Collins's opponent. Uh, and uh, is it Sarah Gideon? Is that the name? Do I have that correct now? I'm, as, as I'm trying to recall it, I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm messing this up. But I think that was correct, right? Sarah Gideon. Yes, there we are. So, yeah, I mean, we're acknowledging that that's the case. That doesn't make a civil conversation rude and it doesn't make it any less valid either. The, the, the declaration is openly that we're going to talk about political issues and how they're viewed by two people on the opposite sides of an ideological line. Uh, secondly, of course, just sort of from Matt Whitlock's, from my perspective of what Matt Whitlock has to say, um, once again, sort of mistaking the idea that a person cannot either have a civil conversation or ought not to question their senator if they donated to the other person, which is also a rather remarkable thing to assume. And I guess if you my guess is if you pressed Matt Whitlock or Senator Collins publicly on those two things, they'd probably collapse pretty quickly. But it's worth noting that that's the way they treat these things. In a similar fashion, uh, I learned way back in 2005 or so that if you were of the opinion that, say, President George W. Bush had violated the Constitution, perhaps his oath of office, and several uh, federal laws by uh, conducting warrantless surveillance of American citizens and thought that he should be impeached for it, and discussed it publicly or in an op-ed or anywhere else, uh, you were branded as, uh, you know, playing partisan politics. You know, this is a partisan attack. Uh, well, you know, this was actually a pretty open discussion of constitutional principles and the rule of law, which really isn't partisan. But the fact that you're, the president we're discussing is a Republican and the person discussing that president's violation of the Constitution is a Democrat doesn't mean it's a partisan issue either, but people love to make that quote-unquote mistake all the time. Uh, a lot of hearkening back to the George W. Bush days recently for me. All right, let's see. By the way, catching up on the actual uh, important news from the world, we have this on-the-ground report from an actual uh, a Canadian with first-hand information. This is not hearsay. Uh, we are hearing from one of, uh, I think it would be fair to say, one of our favorite Canadians. And we have about six that we like a lot. Uh, Ricky the Canuckistani. Ricky May tweets to us that it's not a state holiday uh, Thanksgiving in, in, in Canada, only uh, in that only the government is closed. So not everyone has the day off. Uh, well, I guess that's sort of the case here. We, we're a little more widespread with our days off on Thanksgiving. I guess the people in the grocery store don't get the, the morning off because people need to be able to run in and get uh, turkeys, 
gravy, whatever you might buy at the last minute. Turkey is usually pretty much done. But I guess, look, I don't know. They have turkeys for sale. I'm not saying they don't. So, okay. But uh, the dentist office would likely be closed, for instance. So, okay. I guess that's uh, the difference between Thanksgiving here and there. Thanksgiving has grown. There's been Thanksgiving creep uh, here in the United States, I'm sad to report. Because really, why would you want to be a creep to somebody on Thanksgiving? You're not supposed to do that. But there's uh, since the days that I remember, you know, walking to school uphill eight miles both ways in 12 foot deep snowdrift, et cetera, in the, in the wilds of New Jersey. Uh, but back in back in my day, you know, it's, uh, Thanksgiving meant school was closed Thursday and Friday. Thursday being Thanksgiving, Friday being um, too lazy to go back to school or something. It was it cost more money to turn the heat back on uh, on Friday and then turn it back off again. So we had Friday off as well, travel, etc. And then about uh, I think probably during maybe like high school, it seems to me. I mean, my memory of this may be flawed. They began to give us um, well, actually, I think like middle school. They began to give us Wednesday as ha- a half day which a half day is a phenomenon I think is entirely gone. We don't seem to have them here in our school system. But back in New Jersey, they frequently had half days for whatever reason. Uh, And uh, they would give us a half day Wednesday and you could get home early and uh, drive to, I don't know, over the river and through the woods to grandma's house and uh, go to Thanksgiving dinner. And then they decided the half day was stupid. They may have abolished half days in the school system. I don't know. They went to a Wednesday Thursday, Friday thing. And I'm beginning to see now people, you know, people all over the place are taking off Tuesday so that they can drive Tuesday night and avoid the Wednesday traffic. But that's just plugging things up on on Wednesdays and and now on Tuesdays. And I don't know, people are now beginning to take the entire week off. It's not official, but uh, the Canadians are, I, I guess, way behind us in terms of slacking off and taking extra days but way ahead of us in terms of uh, keeping their heads on straight about Thanksgiving. It's a nice dinner. You don't have to take the whole week off. Uh, But I say that as the person who's not chiefly responsible for stuffing a gigantic bird and cooking it. So, all right, let's see. Uh, Yes, oh, also another comment from Ricky that Windows has a magnifier built in. This is true, but I'm working through the Twitter application, and uh, it wasn't working. So the little magnifying window that you get on Twitter just uh, pops open. It opens once. And I guess you can download the picture and then open it up in Windows. But I'm also on a Mac, so I've got two problems there. But I'm sure there's a magnifier for that, too. Okay, you know, there's other news out there. We don't have to spend it all on uh, how much time you get off from school in Canada, you know. And that wasn't really what I was doing either. It's not the Canadians' fault on this one. Many things to catch up on. And I don't even know where to begin. Uh, where uh, I guess I'll do it here. Um, Rudy Giuliani is extraordinarily corrupt and belongs in prison. And I'll tell you why. Oh, look at this, by the way. I'm sorry. I'm going to jump back here. Did you know that Ricky had her Thanksgiving dinner yesterday? Is that typical? Or did you do that to avoid travel? Or were you just hungry? Did you have an extra turkey lying around and said, might as well do this? Or do you want to get a jump start on things? Not sure why that would happen. Um, anyway, I thought about Rudy Giuliani because Thanksgiving. And um, he's, I think, the probably just the least attractive float in the Macy's parade at this point, And they should just get rid of it. Uh, but I actually saw his name uh, at the moment because I'm, I'm watching Twitter. And Jennifer Hayden, Scout Finch, was just tweeting around. A picture I saw circulated by one of our favorite conspiracy theorists, who usually turns out to be right, Der Wouter, who was tweeting out the, this is a great account that uh, they, uh, Wouter interacts with all the time that I don't know how he would say this name. Uh, and it appears to be Mrs. Panstrip, Pants, Pant, <laughs> Panstripon. <laughs> I'm like, Pan step on. No, not pan strip on. P A N S T R E P P O N. And they trade photos that they've dug up online and evidence of various bits and pieces of the major league Trump, major league Trump uh, corruption all the time. This one I thought was really interesting. 
And actually, I mean, of all things, it ended up bringing Louise Mensch into my timeline, which I wasn't expecting at all. But she stumbled upon this picture, which I guess uh, I will retweet it now for those of you listening live so that you can see this thing. But I thought this was really rather amazing. A An old Getty Images photo showing that Rudy Giuliani showed up at the funeral of former president George H.W. Bush with uh, a guest in tow, not his own personal guest, but he had, in other words, I, I don't know who he's attending with here. Is that Mrs. Was there even a Mrs. Giuliani at that point? I guess I'll read the caption that goes with the image here. Funeral services held for former U.S. President George H.W. Bush. Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, second left, it says here, arrives for a state funeral service for former President George H.W. Bush at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, December 5th, 2018. You all remember this event, of course. Uh, and it uh, goes on to discuss George H.W. Bush, uh, give the photo credit to Al Drago, D-R-A-G-O, uh, for Bloomberg News and handled here by Getty Images. And I don't remember because Rudy Giuliani's been married 18 times or something like that. So that may, I don't remember what they look like. That might be his wife at the time. I think they're divorced now. Uh, he's divor I, or divorced or divorcing from, I think, his third wife. Fairly typical for that circle of people, so whatever. Um, but he's identified as second left, not because immediately to his right, uh, or to the left of, of us, for us looking at him, is another person unidentified by the photographer but clearly familiar to us now because of how awesome and informed we are as Lev Parnas Lev Parnas one of the two Ukrainian lunatics who uh well was mixed up with uh who I guess was mixed up with Giuliani already by that time um but the timeline on Parnas and Fruman, Parnas in particular, is now expanding and has expanded greatly over the weekend. But this was a real surprise, I thought. This is really a wow for me. Uh, Parnas is here with his wife, who may or may not be his third wife. Um, Semi-recognizable from just having seen a bunch of pictures. Don't remember her name. Um, but uh, you're a typical Russian specimen for the oligarch slash mobster set. Uh, clearly somebody who either was or fancied themselves a model. Um, not entirely appropriately dressed really for a funeral either. This sort of, it's black based dressed, but sort of gold, what would you call that? Brocade? I have no idea. Um, but uh, yeah, a little flashy for a state funeral, I would say. And looks like a fur wrap, which, you know, she's Russian, so she didn't catch on to that whole fur is an appropriate thing. But I tweeted that around and just saying, you know, that's kind of a wow. right? And Louise Mensch got into my mentions by commenting that, uh, well, r maybe uh, Rudy Giuliani. I mean, he was still just the famous former mayor of New York City at that point, and we didn't necessarily know how deep his corruption went. But I thought, well, one, that's an astonishing thing for someone like Louise Mensch to say, who is always pretty certain that she knows and has always known about the corruption of all these people. Uh, two, this was December of 2018. It was certainly clear at that point where Rudy Giuliani stood with respect to Donald Trump and how far he would follow him down the rabbit hole in defending him. But that itself wouldn't likely get you disinvited from the funeral either. What Louise missed, I thought, was that Lev, I don't know whether she understood that we were looking, I mean, it said so here, and I don't remember whose tweet I retweeted, whether it was Wooters or Mrs. Penstrepon, uh, Penstrepon, I have no idea how you would pronounce that, but I don't know whether I retweeted that or Wooter's tweet about that one, but the subject was Lev Parnas. He's the wow in all this. And I thought the, the wow is that he manages to get it. How does Lev Parnas at any point in time, but maybe particularly December 5th, 2018, 
How does Lev Parnas rate as a personage to ride Rudy Giuliani's coattails as a guest to the state funeral of George H.W. Bush? That's a that's a serious question. I mean, uh, it's not like it's all that important. Who does really Rudy Giuliani bring to the funeral? First of all, I mean, really guests to a funeral. But you would think that he would bring a more established American figure or, or an American figure at all. I guess he's a Ukrainian American. He's an American citizen. But of all the people that you could bring to George H.W.'s state funeral, Lev Parnas, you're at best... The client that you represent in trying to secure a natural gas deal or whatever deal they were trying to secure at that point. He's been in like 15 different businesses and he's a cheater and a liar in all of them. But you bring your your law clients. I don't know where Fruman was. Maybe he wasn't available. But what a, I thought that was really kind of incredible to, to sort of – and I don't know how it was initiated. Did I'd love to know. Does Parnas tell Giuliani, you know, I want – in on this funeral, uh, the place to be, the place to be seen. I guess he probably thought he could make some Republican connections there, and he probably could, which is maybe a little distasteful, but tells you what you need to know about Republicans, that they would do this at a funeral. But maybe everybody does this stuff at funerals. I don't know. I only go to funerals for people I'm sad about when they're dead, and I wouldn't know anything about a funeral like this. Uh, but to bring Lev Parnas seems to me either inexplicable or this guy, I mean, I don't know, is it, where's the client relationship, client, uh, client attorney or client, uh, I don't know what you, he's not serving him as an attorney, but what is this relationship? Who's pulling the strings here in all of this? It's very odd, and uh, I couldn't believe Louise Mensch would miss that, except that, you know, I don't know if she really understands anything about American politics. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Or read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. It'd be great if the microphone were on when I started that statement. It wasn't, but, uh, well, you know, I probably could have just kept going without mentioning that. But uh, that's transparency for you. Our version of transparency on the show, we tell you when we screwed up, even if you didn't hear it the first time. All right, let's see. One Twitter notice now uh, circulating. President Trump's former top Russia advisor, and I can't believe he even had one, Dr. Fiona Hill is arriving for her testimony at the Capitol this morning. Well put there, as opposed to saying uh, on the Hill this morning, because she is the Hill, Fiona Hill, arriving on the Hill. Um, I don't know what sort of testimony they think they're going to get out of her on whether she's the kind of person who intends to show up and be honest and let them know that Donald Trump is sunk uh, with respect to his impeachment uh, based on what she knows and she'll let us know that or whether she intends to defend him or what. I have no idea. Um, Fiona Hill, I'm really unfamiliar with. And uh, I guess that tells you a little something, too. If she's the former top Russia advisor and one, she's not there anymore. That's interesting. And two, um, why would he accept anyone advising him about Russia? He'll just call Vladimir Putin and ask him, how do I feel about Russia? So it was a superfluous position, and she probably resigned from it for that reason. Okay, um, good to know, just to keep track of who's testifying to who and why. Uh, another big story last night and this morning, covered this morning on Daily Coast's front page by Barbara Morrill, taking care of business for us on the story of the fake video of Trump shooting media critics and political foes. That was shown at his Miami resort. 
I guess not Mar-a-Lago, but the Doral Resort. Uh, she tells it this way, Donald Trump, who regularly incites violence against the media, who he calls the enemy of the people, you are aware of that, and his political foes as well, must be so proud. It is reported by, uh, let's see, the New York Times is who she's excerpting from here. A video depicting a macabre scene of a fake President Trump, uh, and he is a fake president, shooting, stabbing, and brutally assaulting members of the news media and his political opponents was shown at a conference for his supporters at his Miami resort last week, according to footage obtained by the New York Times. And Barbara continues here. A couple of notable figures attending this fun-filled conference, uh, some of the names, Donald Trump Jr., Sarah Huckabee Sanders uh, among them, both denied having seen the video, with Huckabee Sanders claiming that she was just there to lead a prayer, you see, and talk about unity and bringing the country together. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, and uh, Barb's uh huh is the one I read there in the video. Well, um, I took a look at it. I did finally actually see the thing, and uh, it's uh, footage stolen from one of the movies, uh, some f- stupid movie, the Kingsman movies. I think there's more than one, and you would likely, if you saw it, you'd recognize it. Uh, and they Photoshop Trump's head onto the body of the protagonist who enters for one reason or another. The whole movie is almost like a spoof of action movies, I guess. It probably actually is one, but I'm not really familiar with it. I've seen snippets of it on like HBO or whatever. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to misstate the purpose and message of this important film. You know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But he threw whatever movie magic finds himself in a church somewhere uh, slaughtering everybody inside. Not not really exactly mass shooter style, although, I mean, well, frankly, you are a mass shooter in a church at the end of this scene. But it's it seemed to me like a send up of crazy action movies where this one guy is miraculously, for some reason, able to kill hundreds of enemies armed with the, you know, sticks, stones, knife, gun, and uh, whatever's handy uh, around this, the scene. Anyway, I I could see where an idiot 20-something meme-loving, 4chan-loving doofus would think it was hilarious to, to do this and think No one could possibly take it seriously because, of course, it is lifted from a movie, for one thing, and it is lifted from a movie, which no one is supposed to take seriously. Uh, But these are the times in which we live, and I don't think it's where I'm not, I don't intend to excuse it in any way. Um, And uh, who am I? I'm not getting in the way of this forest fire. This is, uh, you know, it's damaging to Trump, so fine. I'll let it burn on for now. But uh, that's what people are talking about today. And, of course, it's particularly interesting and worrisome because Trump's audiences and Trump, the intended audience of this idiotic uh, video are not very good. In fact, they're among the worst at being able to interpret these videos uh, and handle them appropriately. The problem with these people is that the viewing of these things... The message that's taken away is very often uh, Trump wants me to do this to these people. He's not free to do it himself. He's busy playing golf for the 200th something time. Uh, But he would be very appreciative if I did this to people. And of course, then there's the overtone of mass shooter, particularly mass shooter in a church thing. And it's uh, inappropriate in the extreme. But uh, here we are. So I don't know. I thought I would note that for you. And I I don't know that it necessarily uh, belongs atop the news, but it can't be ignored either because some idiot is going to do something and claim this as his inspiration. And then we're going to have to scramble to figure out where this thing came from. And it's better to have a heads up than not to. That's the way I'll view it. Okay, let's see. Diving back into pocket to try and give some semblance of order to things today. Uh, I should be looking at pocket and looking back at uh, 
my own Twitter stream to see if I can reconstruct the weekend. Once again, so many things happened that it's impossible to keep track of. I did say in the morning post that uh, this is usually on a Monday where we joke among ourselves that we're we made it. We're still alive. Trump hasn't killed us all over the weekend. But of course, the problem with making that joke this particular day is that there are a lot of people who didn't survive the weekend thanks to Donald Trump. And you uh, were almost assuredly preoccupied all weekend if you were watching Trump news with his decision to force a precipitous withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria, uh, literally to have agreed ahead of time with uh, President Erdogan of Turkey to get out of the way of his planned invasion of northern Syria for the purpose of uh, presumably either perpetrating a genocide against the Kurds, which has long been his dream, or at the very least to occupy the territory in northern Syria in order to, uh, I guess their version of things is, the Turkish version of things is that they want to establish some sort of buffer zone between the peacefully resettled Kurds on the one hand and the Turkish border on the other, uh, the buffer being this chunk of Syria, which no longer belongs to them and is under Turkish control, and no Kurds are allowed in it either. And uh, I'm not certain what sort of what would you call that, and how would you recognize it under, say, uh, United Nations auspices if you were to try to do something like that. That's their version of it. We just we're just clearing the area. You don't have to stay here, but you can't live in it or anywhere for that matter if you don't move quickly enough for for the Turks and the Turks and uh, the pro Turkish but anti Syrian government militants that they're using to perpetrate all this. It's a very confusing situation in northern Syria. And it is rightfully, I believe, rightfully pointed out that um, in many cases, the the actual actors on the ground who are particularly those who are perpetrating some of the greater war crimes against the Kurdish people, the crimes that are being alleged, are not Turkish regular army, but rather a pro-Turkish militia faction of i presume syrian nationality presume i i think they may be syrian nationals i it's not entirely clear to me i'm not an issue area expert here but uh others are claiming that uh well and, and probably correctly given the history of things in the middle east in general but claiming that these irregular forces who are perpetrating war crimes, atrocities, allegedly against the Kurdish population there and getting, I think, rightfully condemned by most Americans and most of the West and the rest of NATO as well, by the way, um, are in fact uh, similarly comprised, if not exactly the same people who were once proposed as uh, non militant, uh, that is non-militant Islamic, jihadi, as uh, people like to cover them, paint them with a broad brush, that they were moderate Arabs who were opposed to the Assad regime and could be, hmm, with relative safety, safety, armed by America and the West to uh, fight against Assad as proxies, only this time they were being armed by the Turks instead and used against the uh, the Kurds as, as proxies in, in that particular war. And they may very well be the same people. And it would be very interesting to know whether we were, I don't know, you and I probably weren't necessarily backing the, the plan I, that I recall being chiefly associated with uh, John McCain to arm the moderates here. Where are all the moderates that we can arm to fight and slaughter people in our name so that we don't have to do it with our own troops? 
you know, a, always a great plan in the Middle East for the United States. Anyway, uh, all of that now going on. And, uh, well, it wasn't a stable situation to begin with. But in the middle of all of it, of course, was what we got to discuss at the end of last week, that there were many, many ISIS fighters being held prisoner by the Kurdish forces acting as our proxies in Syria. And that uh, the invasion by Turkey now leaves the control of the area uncertain, the prisoners escaping. There's a disagreement, let's say, out there over whether or not the highest value, the most dangerous ISIS prisoners, the highest value prisoners, as they like to call them, in, I don't know, strategic circles, whether or not they have been secured. And there's some discrepancy as between Donald Trump and uh, today and his government today and Donald Trump and his government a few days ago and news reporting on the subject. Um, there's a lot of conflict and there's probably no way of, of telling exactly who is where. No accounting for any of them. I did notice last night Greg Sargent tweeting uh, thus, remarkable and important new reporting from the New York Times, he says, officials are now letting it be known that U.S. counter-terror initiatives were derailed by the chain of events set in motion by Donald Trump's decision. A uh, screenshot from this New York Times article is attached. The article is entitled, Abandoned by U.S. and Syria, Kurds Find New Ally in American Foe. Uh, yes, and that's uh, a major theme also as well. The Kurds, having been ba abandoned by the United States, are looking for a new military patron, and they're turning to the Russians and Syria's Russian-backed government, which is just a great coup for uh, American foreign policy. It's fantastic. But the point of this screenshot was slightly different. The screenshot section reads, the American military was unable to carry out a plan to transfer about five dozen high-value Islamic State detainees out of Kurdish-run wartime prisons before the Pentagon decided to move its forces out of northern Syria and pave the way for a Turkish-led invasion, according to two American officials. Uh, that's not even it. That paragraph could be discussed forever, too. Or the idea that we ran out of the way to pave the way was the language they used for a Turkish-led invasion, is incredible on about five different levels. But we're moving on. In the same area Sunday, on Sunday, hundreds of Islamic State sympathizers escaped from a low-security detention camp in the region, taking advantage of the chaos caused by the Turkish ground invasion and the accompanying strikes. Both developments underscored the pandemonium unleashed by President Trump's sudden decision to order American troops to evacuate part of the region, uh, Syrian region, bordering Turkey. That allowed President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey to order an invasion of Syrian territory controlled by a Kurdish-led militia that was at the center of American-led efforts to contain the Islamic State over the past several years. All right, so that lays the whole scenario out. The important stuff is right up, I mean, to my view, the, the, or rather the part I wanted to emphasize right up at the top, the American military was unable to carry out a plan to transfer about five dozen high-value Islamic State detainees out of these prisons. The rest of it is about uh, uh, low-level, I don't know whether they're even uh, Islamic State operatives. They're described here as sympathizers. I'm not even sure what that exactly means uh, and why you're imprisoned for sympathy, but I guess, you know, sympathy with a, uh, well, sympathy with people like ISIS, you know, that's pretty dangerous. So, okay, fine, whatever. Uh, I can't comment on the legal situation there, but this would just grab my attention because the American military was unable to carry out this plan to transfer five dozen high-value prisoners. Uh, the other day, I'm pretty sure I, we saw Trump insisting that those prisoners had, in fact, been moved. And I'm pretty sure I saw a video clip of it 
of him insisting as much from the South Lawn of the White House the other day, too. But I included a link to a Time magazine piece from middle of last week, end of last week, I guess it was 10th. Was that the, uh, it might have been Thursday, the 10th. President Trump said U.S. moved ISIS prisoners as Turkey attacked Syria. Now, I don't know whether some prisoners got moved and others didn't, or whether this is just another case of Trump purports that the prisoners have been moved because that's what the American people want to hear when they hear that there's chaos in northern Syria and possibly involving the escape of ISIS prisoners. Surely you took the time to secure them, right? So the president will say, sure, yes, absolutely, I did. And then we'll find out later on. Uh, no, they were not secured. They didn't get moved. They've escaped. And this is another episode of this has been another episode of how to read a Trump comment trademark. Uh, time reported very clearly last week. President Donald Trump said Wednesday that the U.S. has moved some of the Islamic State prisoners amid fears some could escape custody as Turkey invades northeast Syria. Turkey is attacking the U.S.-backed Syrian Defense Forces, a Kurdish force that battled the Islamic State group alongside American troops and is now responsible for guarding thousands of detained militants. But guarding those prisoners is now expected to be less of a priority, like not at all, for the Kurdish forces as they rush to defend their territory against the invading Turkish military. Although, as it turns out, uh, current reports are that they're simply letting... Uh, the Syrian government deal with the Turkish incursion. They're surrendering essentially to the Assad regime, the Kurdish are, in the hopes that the Syrian government forces will be primarily concerned with defending the territorial integrity of northern Syria and only secondarily with the idea of punishing, capturing, murdering, massacring the Kurds who happen to live there. And that might be their best bet at the moment. I don't know. I don't know if I would advise it necessarily, but that might be the outcome. Uh, Trump told reporters at the White House, according to Time magazine, that some of the most dangerous had been moved, but he did not say how many or where they had been taken. We're putting them in different locations where it's secure, he said, which almost certainly means no, we're not. Um, there's more to the article, of course, and uh, I think it would be benefit us all to read through it and educate ourselves, but that's not how I meant to spend this time. Uh, but I wanted to move on. But I, I wanted to note for the record that we might be in the same situation once again, where Trump told the press that the most dangerous ISIS prisoners had been moved, and he was talking out of his ass, and they hadn't been moved. And now they've escaped and we'll play around for a little while about, well, he said some had been moved. And was it this one? Was it that one? Uh, I can virtually guarantee based on his track record that uh, all the worst are out and about. And you can blame Donald Trump for it, as well as for the deaths among the Kurdish population up there. If you haven't begun, I encourage you to get started because it's already too late. All right. Let's see. Uh, other important information developing over the weekend um, is, well, likewise very varied. Let me see. Um, have we? No, we haven't discussed all of this. I think I spent a lot of time on this on Twitter over the weekend, and I'm going to need uh, maybe a little more clearance in all this because, uh, well, I don't know. I guess it's still a little while from the break coming up. Um, I think at this point, maybe what I ought to do is jump back to the Twitter feed and reconstruct what I was talking about on Friday uh, about this one. And uh, man, this, uh, I, I did a little more looking into Parnas. We did learn over the weekend and maybe leading into the weekend that the relationship between Donald Trump and Parnas, which Trump, of course, denies. I don't know these guys. I never met them before. I might be in a picture with them, but I'm in a pictures with a lot of people, that sort of thing. And I was also wondering, well, you know, uh, how many people get in a picture or warrant a picture 
with both you and Pence at the White House, for instance. And uh, it turns out Parnas and Fruman did. And I, I think I've seen that picture now identified as being at a White House Hanukkah party, which I didn't even realize that they started to do again. Uh, I thought they blew that off the first year, but I guess they're now back into it because they can bring people like Lev Parnas and, and Igor Fruman in. But anyway, um, then uh, by the <clears throat> by the weekend, we were seeing other old older images brought up, and I think a 2014 photo of Trump and Parnas together at one of the golf resorts down in Florida. This, of course, would have been before Trump had even declared as a candidate. And it's just an interesting pairing in that, uh, one, Trump wasn't a candidate yet, but he was a political figure, certainly looked like he was going to do something stupid like run for president. And uh, secondly, uh, we recall that part of the big story about Parnas and Fruman was that they only lately became, very lately, became major political donors. So the 2014 photo together meant something other than routine political activity, for instance, and displayed, you know, some more depth to their relationship, though it could also still be passerby who sees celebrity and wants photo. Uh, but over the weekend, there was also uh, a lot more digging done on Parnas, and it also turns out that there's even more. Now, not necessarily the sort of relationship that leads us to uh, believe that they were close friends and knew one another, but Parnas apparently in the past has sold condos for the Trump organization. Uh, his claim, Parnas's claim, is that this was way back in the 80s, I believe, when Fred Trump was still alive and I guess still nominally even possibly the head of the Trump organization. And he was selling, um, you know, Brooklyn territory, uh, not the Manhattan Trump Tower condos per se, but also just sort of an interesting thing that this relationship would go so far back and that there would be so much Trump adjacency for so many years was very interesting. But then uh, I thought the more interesting big picture stuff was left over from last week when we were talking on the air about my theorizing that maybe the real story of the Ukraine scandal that we're watching develop now centered around the telephone call with President Zelensky. Uh, maybe the real story, I thought, was that Fruman and Parnas were looking to make a big score in the natural gas business in Ukraine because that's sort of been thrown wide open with the iffiness of supply uh, and the, the dangers of being cut off by the Russians, etc., and that there was room for possibly a new player to come and make a killing in the not really all that transparent or honest natural gas market in Ukraine, and that a better, more sophisticated set of players might have been able to pass this off as a reform effort, that we are going to bring American trans business transparency and business practices, which, you know, are pretty dubious to begin with, but probably better than things are in Ukraine in general. I'm speaking in generalities. Uh, but you could plausibly pass off the injection of, you know, forcing in the door of American businessmen into the natural gas market in Ukraine as a uh, reform measure. But we were wondering, what if the real story here is that Parnas and Fruman just wanted to take a cut of the natural gas market and that the best way to do it was to ding the incumbents in this. There's a, a natural gas monopoly that runs things directly in there uh, in, in Ukraine, Naftogaz, but they buy their gas from several sources. They wanted to become one of them with their new company and 
that perhaps the best way of doing that would be to uh, either spread rumors that their rivals for such contracts were themselves corrupt and ought to be investigated and or imprisoned, or if they couldn't move, if they couldn't just get rid of their rivals that way, uh, or dislodge them that way, or maybe they just wanted to belt and suspenders this thing, also accuse the executives of Naftagaz and other state officials who make decisions about who Naftagaz will buy from, accuse them of corruption and see if we can get them cleared out of the way and arrested. And also along the way, other people who would interfere with this process, who might say, for instance, show up as the United States ambassador and say, no, these people who are being accused of corruption aren't in fact corrupt. They're being accused by corruption by a couple of con men who want them arrested so that they're out of the way so that these con men can sneak in here and sweep up their profits in natural gas instead. And so then the project becomes, well, you've got to remove that person too. The American ambassador who knows the truth about us has to be gotten to as well. And uh, that's, hey, what do you know? All of a sudden, that's the direction that things took. So things are easily explained by theorizing that Fruman and Parnas were just out to get in on the liquid natural gas action and their accusations of uh, corruption were against their rivals. And as it happens, they thought this was a win-win because they could also perhaps throw some of this shade onto Joe Biden by association and help out Donald Trump, somebody who at least Parnas had had a long business slash crime association with uh, for many years. And he thought, well, I can pay him back. Uh, the fact that he's president of the United States can now be leveraged into power to break into the liquid natural gas market in Ukraine after all. And maybe that's what we ought to do. You remember that, right? I'll pick up on it on the other side. We'll be right back. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Okay, so picking up on all of that background, just reminding people who might not have heard the show last week or who heard it and forgot or who heard it and were depressed and got drunk and blotted it from their memory, whatever it might have been. Uh, so my working theory there being that uh, the whole thing was essentially about well, it was the, the Biden stuff was concocted and constructed around the idea of I really want to knock out incumbents in the natural gas business in Ukraine. And if I can also help Donald Trump along the way, fantastic. Uh, or maybe a better explanation is I want to knock out incumbents in the natural gas business. And that's a long shot. But one great way of doing it is if you could get the government of Ukraine to come down on these people, it might just work. And maybe I can get the government of Ukraine to come down on them if the government of the United States comes down on them or comes down on the government of Ukraine or both and makes it happen because the United States is that kind of power, that kind of bully. You can do that stuff uh, ordinarily and probably do it through what most of us would still recognize as uh, underhanded but legitimate means. <clears throat> but... It's it's that much easier when you have Donald Trump on your team because he'll do the thing, the stupid thing that you're not supposed to do, which is to say, well, I got an idea how we'll leverage them to do this. Why don't we just take away their money? That's the way I work with everybody. I'll just threaten them. You can't have your money to defend yourself against Russia until you give us dirt on Biden. Uh, why do you want dirt on Biden? Well, I want dirt on Biden so I can run against him. Uh, and my friends want dirt on Biden because it'll get the other Biden out of their way and cast uh, aspersions against some of the natural gas incumbents in the market and make room for them. And they'll make a killing and then they will kick part of that killing back to me in political contributions and or just straight up bribery or emoluments or what have you. And uh, it's win win all around. So um, I got to thinking about all of this, I, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while, but do you remember, I, here's what it reminded me of. Do you remember prior to, I think, yeah, right? Considerably prior to the breakout of the Ukraine scandal, we spent some time 
talking about Yulia Tymoshenko, the former prime minister of Ukraine, who, if you remember her at all, either from the show or not from the show, um, discussion on the show, it's not like she was on the show. She didn't accept our Skype call. I didn't try, is really what I'm saying. But you might remember her as the crazy braid lady. Not that she's crazy herself, but that she had these enormously long blonde braids that she wore in this like otherworldly, I don't know whether that's traditional Ukrainian thing, wore the hair braided in like in this circular pattern on top of her head. Not, not exactly a bun, but anyway, she, she had, uh, she had some crazy hairstyles going on. She could have done the full princess Leia, but she did not. And so, you know, I don't know. I think that might've worked for her, but apparently not. Anyway, she was, the prime minister in uh, of Ukraine uh, back in the early 2000s, and she's still involved in Ukrainian politics, which is just how crazy the whole thing is. But I spent some time discussing her, and I remember telling you I had some idea vaguely in the back of my head that she was uh, had been attacked or uh, associated with some anti-Semitic sentiment and was therefore somehow somewhat suspect here in the United States. And then we learned that, uh, in fact, there had been a Paul Manafort coordinated plan to try to tar her in Western view as anti-Semitic. And that it was a, a plan that, that Manafort had executed and I guess had been relatively successful. And we were upset to learn that we had fallen for it. We meaning me. Uh, but maybe you too. Uh, and I read about Timoshenko and what her situation was. And I forgot this part. I went back and uh, I, and read through just a couple of articles and her Wikipedia page, which is not always a great source for these things. But I had forgotten, uh, or maybe I never knew in the first place. It's hard for me to remember. Do you know, uh, you know how it is in Ukraine and how uh, in, in politics in Ukraine, it tends to be the case that the people who are rising to the top of Ukrainian politics, with the exception of the current newly elected president, tend to have spent their prior lives as uh, enormously wealthy people, typically, essentially the sorts of people we might call oligarchs, but people who got a hold, uh, who got in on the ground floor of the fantastic opportunity of privatizing state resources after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, but, you know, enormously wealthy people who were able to uh, become very famous there and, and capitalize on that by uh, running for office. And she was no different in that sense. Uh, where did Yulia Timoshenko make her real fortune? And the answer is energy and natural gas, as well as gasoline uh, sales in, in Ukraine. All energy sources there, I guess, are extraordinarily lucrative uh, for the fossil fuel ones. Anyway, Yulia Timoshenko, though, was apparently known in some circles anyway as the gas princess. I did not know that. And um, I, what I thought was really interesting in reading about her was the convoluted ways in which she was eventually taken down. It wasn't just that she was accused of being anti-Semitic. She was also accused of corruption in, in her dealings, both in, in government and prior to her being in government, in the deals that she cut, particularly in supplying natural gas to the market in Ukraine. And it occurred to me after reading more about it and how long this battle went on and how there were situations. You know, I mean, maybe I should just pull up the Wikipedia page and read through portions of it with you. Um, although it seems like, well, I'll have to skip around a little bit just to try to keep things <clears throat> somewhat topical. But uh, <clears throat> let me grab the, the page here. And... Um, I mean, it's a long, long entry. And uh, let me skip down here to 2011. I mean, her, her career begins, like I said, in the mid-2000s, her political career. 
Uh, I think she first runs for office in 2002 or so. We can look down here at her political career section. Uh, she's the deputy prime minister for fuel and energy um, in, you know, which I guess surprises no one given where she was making her money in uh, 1999, from December 1999 to January 2001. She's running for the parliament. She's in parliament. Uh, <clears throat> I guess she would have been at that point in order for her to be deputy prime minister, I guess. But anyway, um she also has a, I guess she really rises to prominence in what they called their, the Orange Revolution in the mid-2000s. Um, she becomes prime minister in January of 2005 for the first time, and she's served different terms here. So January 24, 2005, Timoshenko appointed by acting prime minister of Ukraine under, or, or rather was appointed acting prime minister, and we do have that. Except, uh, right, acting prime minister under Yushchenko's presidency, right? Remember Yushchenko. Um, on February 4th, Timoshenko's premiership appointment was ratified by the parliament. Overwhelming majority, by the way. Uh, 373 votes, apparently 226 were necessary for approval. First woman appointed prime minister of Ukraine. Uh, so things are going pretty well here. There's uh, an election in 2006. We'll skip all of this part. There's a parliamentary elections in 2006 and then again in 2007. She's a second term of prime as prime minister from 2007 to 2010. I don't know whether that means she lost the uh, majority in the prime ministership in the in the meantime. Um, although that's important because of what we learn comes later. And then a 2008 political crisis of some kind arises. And I believe that in 2008, the political crisis for them there, ours was uh, financial, but I believe their crisis actually centered around natural gas supplies from Russia. And there was a huge dispute, a gas war, it was uh, informally called, as between Russia and Ukraine fighting over <clears throat> the terms by which natural gas supplies were going to be uh, bought from Russia, the price at which they were going to be bought, and um, the mechanics of how the gas would be bought and sold. Um, there's a, you know, well, in these sometimes corrupt systems, you have a, a number of middlemen. And apparently that's where all the corruption lay, or a bulk of the corruption lay, in the sort of accepted practice of using middlemen as dealers in this gas sold by the Russian state entity to the Ukrainian state entity. There's a little bit on the gas dispute between Russia and Ukraine in 2009 down here that I guess maybe we would do well to read. The conditions leading to the 2009 gas dispute were created in 2006 under the Viktor Yushchenko government. When Ukraine started buying Russian gas through an intermediary, Swiss registered, and you can't even say this word. I mean, there's no way to pronounce it. Ross Ukr Energo. That would be Ross Russian Ukr U K R Ukraine Russian Ukrainian Energo Energo. I don't know what that. So Russia Ukrainian Energy <clears throat> is this mashup of what this word is supposed to look like. Fifty percent of this Ross, uh, you know, Russian Ukrainian Energy Company's shares. 50% of this company shares were owned by the Russian gas monopoly, Gazprom. 45% and then another 5% minority stake were owned by private investors. Okay, um, that said, the 45% stake in this middleman dealer was owned by Dmitry Furtash. Furtash, yes, the guy who we told you on Friday is the one under house arrest in Vienna who's fighting extradition to the United States with the help of Victoria Tensing and Joe de Geneva, who hired as their translator for the case Lev Parnas. So, yeah, 
So Dmitry Firtash is an almost 50% owner in partnership with Gazprom, the Russian gas monopoly, which is just universally acknowledged to be a Kremlin-run entity. Uh, so interesting. The 5% is, uh, I don't see, who's the, uh, oh, Ivan Fursin, F-U-R-S-I-N, is the 5% owner. I don't see his name come up all that often anywhere else. Some sources indicate, Wikipedia here notes, that notorious criminal boss Sergei Schneider, who is known as Semyon Mogolovich, we've that's the name we've heard before, uh, I think in with respect to Felix Sater, of all people, that Mogolovich uh, is the real owner and that Firtash is sort of a front here. That's the that's the working theory. Well, uh, that's pretty interesting. So when Timoshenko, when Yulia Timoshenko resumed her prime minister duties in 2007, she initiated direct relations between Ukraine and Russia with regard to gas trading. In other words, they were paying through the nose in Ukraine. And, you know, that's probably to be expected. And she thought that maybe they could pay less if they, you know, what does the commercial say? Eliminate the middleman. So she wanted to cut Ross Euchre Energo or whatever the however you would say that out of the picture, which to be well, naturally they would be upset about that, and that would upset Dmitry Firtash, certainly, because he was making his money that way. On the other hand, uh does it make a great deal of difference to the Kremlin? Gazprom owns fifty percent of this middleman, and Gazprom is the source of the gas, and they're getting paid regardless. In fact, they're getting all the money as opposed to getting 50% of the money if they're buying through this partnership with Firtash. So I'm sure Timoshenko thought this was a brilliant idea, but she forgot, I don't know, or she maybe she knew, because she may be an oligarch herself, that uh, oligarchs are dangerous people, especially when you threaten their money. So when Timoshenko resumed the prime ministership in 2007, and she initiates these direct relations for buying gas, in October of 2008, a memorandum signed by Timoshenko and Vladimir Putin, I guess he was willing to agree, stipulated liquidation of intermediaries in gas deals between the two countries and outlined detailed conditions for future gas contracts. So it works, right? It's a win-win. Ukraine gets to buy gas somewhat cheaper. Putin still gets money. And he gets control of all of it instead of having to share it with Firtash. The gas conflict of 2009 broke out because of two factors. It says here, the lack of a gas contract for 2009 <clears throat> and a $2.4 $2 billion debt that Ukraine had yet to pay for gas received in 2008. Prime Minister Timoshenko stated that it was the Ross Ukur Energo company that was responsible for the debt rather than the state of Ukraine. In other words, Timoshenko said the $2.4 billion has to come out of Firtash's pocket, not Ukraine's pocket. She called for an end to corruption in the gas trade area. That sounds like a good thing. And the establishment of direct contacts with the Russian Federation. Ross Ukur Energo, I have no idea how I'm supposed to say that, with the aid of its ties to Yushchenko's administration, managed to disrupt the signing of the gas contract scheduled for December 31st, 2008. Uh, some names here that we haven't called yet here, but uh, Ole Alexei Miller. Is it Miller? It is Miller. Miller. Wow, that's easy to pronounce. He was the head of Gazprom at the time, and he stated that the trader, Ross Yucker Energo, broke down talks between Gazprom and Naftogaz Ukraini, that is the Ukrainian uh, gas monopoly. Yes, indeed, this is a quote. Yes, indeed, in late December 2008, the prime ministers of Russia and Ukraine came to agreement and our companies were ready to seal the deal for $235 per 1,000 cubic meters, whatever that means, of natural gas with the condition that all the export operations from Ukraine, export operations from Ukraine, yes, will be done bilaterally. Ross Yukur Energo then suggested to buy gas at a $285 price. 
On December 31st, 2008, President Viktor Yushchenko gave Oleg Dobinya, head of Naftagaz Ukraine, a direct order to stop talks, not sign the agreement, and recall the delegation from Moscow. The decision made by the president of Ukraine brought on the crisis. All right, are we following so far? January 14th, 2009, Prime Minister Timoshenko said the negotiations on $235 gas price and the $1.7 to $1.8, that's what it says, transit price, that started on October 2nd and successfully have been moving forward since have been broken up because, unfortunately, Ukrainian politicians were trying to keep Ross Yukur Energo in business as a shadow intermediary, Dmitry Ferdash, right? Negotiations between the two prime ministers and later between Gazprom and Naftagaz were ruined by those Ukrainian political groups who have gotten and are planning to get corrupt benefits from Ross Yukur Energo. Hmm, sounds bad, right? On January 17th, 2009, President of Russia, then Dmitry Medvedev, remember this was the period during which Putin was Prime Minister, swapped jobs with Medvedev for a while. Medvedev said, I think our Ukrainian partners and us can trade gas without any intermediaries, especially without intermediaries with questionable reputation. The problem is that some participants of negotiations insisted on keeping the intermediary, referring to the instructions from the top. So the Yushchenko government in Ukraine is fighting to disrupt the direct dealing of gas between Gazprom and Naftagaz and keep Dmitry Firtash's business as the middleman. Timoshenko is fighting to get the middleman out, Firtash. I I don't know whether they had anything personal going on or not, but she wants the middleman eliminated here. Because everyone knows, like the commercials say, there's big savings to be had when that happens. January 1st, 2009, at 10 a.m., apparently important, Gazprom completely stopped pumping gas to Ukraine. And it's middle of January, well, the beginning of January, and it's freezing. You die in Ukraine without enough energy, right? It's just too cold. January 4th, the Russian monopolist, I guess that's Gazprom, offered to sell Ukraine gas now for $450 per 1,000 cubic meters, minus a fee for gas transit through Ukraine, which was defined as a standard price for Eastern European countries. What? Really? On January 8, 2009, the Prime Minister of Russia, Vladimir Putin, said that Ukraine would have to pay $470 per 1,000 cubic meters of natural gas. <clears throat> Do we see how Putin got so rich? Between... The 1st and the 18th of January, Central and European, Eastern European countries received significantly less gas. Ukrainian heat and power stations were working to utmost capacity. This is a little stilted, but due to sub-zero temperatures, the entire housing and public utilities sectors were on the verge of collapse. On 14th of January, the European Commission and the Czech presidency of the European Union Uh, demanded the immediate renewal of gas deliveries in full capacity, lest the reputations of Russia and Ukraine as reliable EU partners be seriously damaged. On 18th of January, after five-day-long talks, Prime Ministers Putin and Timoshenko came to agreement on the renewal of gas delivery to Ukraine and other EU countries. The parties agreed upon the following a return to direct contract deals between Gazprom and Naftogaz, the removal of non-transparent intermediaries, introduction of formula-based pricing for Ukraine, which also works for other Eastern European countries, and a switch to a $2.7 transfer fee, which is close to the average price in Europe. We'll take their word for it. According to the new gas contract in 2009, Ukraine paid an average price of $232.98 per 1,000 cubic meters, while other European consumers were paying above 500 per 1,000 cubic meters. Okay, so that's in the background of all of this. Now, at some point, Timoshenko runs for, ends up running for president in 2010. But Yanukovych is, uh, well, let's see, have we skipped, moved presidents here? Uh, is Yanukovych the, uh, just trying to, no, it's Yushchenko, 
that Timoshenko is prime minister under. And in the 2010 election is Yanukovych versus Timoshenko. And Timoshenko loses the election. And Yanukovych comes in. Uh, right. So um, it's Yanukovych who ends up... Yanukovych is, uh, is, is Manafort's candidate that he's working with. And uh, of course, he's also got relationships with Oleg Deripaska and with Dmitry Firtash. Now, if we skip over to, you have to establish his relationship, Manafort's relationship with Firtash elsewhere. Apparently, Firtash and Deripaska both go in to a deal with Manafort for built for New York real estate of all things, the proposed Bulgari tower, apparently like a you know billion dollar skyscraper plan for Manhattan that falls through, and I think becomes the initial one of the initial sources for Deripaska's you know furious rage with Manafort. The Manafort is like absconding with money that Deripaska and later Firtash are investing in various things. And this is the origin of the huge debt that Manafort owes to Deripaska that he tries to repay in uh, private briefings about the American presidential race and the release of polling numbers to Deripaska. What Deripaska finds so valuable about those things, we're not yet sure, but... The theory is that he's passing them on to the Kremlin and they're using it to direct their interference. Now, what happens to Timoshenko is not just losing the election, but losing the election to Manafort's guy and Manafort being connected to Firtash and Firtash's business being threatened entirely with, with uh, being wiped out by Timoshenko's plan for how to buy gas from Russia to supply Ukraine. What happens uh, next for our purposes comes down in 2011. You may not remember this about Yulia Timoshenko, but Yulia Timoshenko is at this point accused of all sorts of corruption, both in office and prior to her time in office, and is put on trial. The upshot, long story short, she's imprisoned on corruption charges, which later... After um, uh, Yushchenko is forced from office, or Yanukovych rather, is forced from office and runs away to Moscow, uh, the the charges are essentially dismissed. The, she's exonerated by the high courts in Ukraine at the urging of the European Union and <clears throat> pretty much the rest of the world, which recognized the show trial as garbage. So in other words, Manafort's guy, who happens to also be Firtash's guy, wins the presidency, turns the apparatus of state against Timoshenko, the former prime minister of Ukraine, accusing her of corruption in, oh, I don't know, the natural gas market, <clears throat> railroads her into prison and thinks the job is done, but of course he's eventually deposed in an uprising himself. But if you were wondering, for instance, in all of this crazy Ukrainian stuff, what would give some, some nudnik mook like Lev Parnas or Rudy Giuliani for that matter, or Donald Trump for that matter, the idea that the Ukraine, not sorry, that not the Ukraine, but that Ukraine was a place you could go and approach a government and get them to agree to trump up fake corruption charges over, let's say, the mishandling of natural gas purchasing against a prominent figure, maybe even as prominent as the former vice president of the United States, and A, would just generate that dirt on request, and two, press the case far enough to put that person in legal jeopardy. 
where would you get the idea that that was something that you could do to Joe Biden or anybody else? And the answer is Yulia Timoshenko. They actually did it to their own prime minister. They put her in jail for exactly this kind of uh, accusation of corruption. It's really rather amazing. And I, I'm wondering, before I drop the subject after this, perhaps, whether or not that might not actually be the inspiration here. It might be more than they just wanted to dislodge incumbents but that it was a play that they had run before with enormous success, imprisoning their own prime minister. So surely this could be done to someone like Biden, or at least Biden's son, right? Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting... Two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week. And how that came out to about 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal. Except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that. And even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, and they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, I said I was going to drop the subject, but uh, I don't know. I find it hard to transition away from it. I just thought I would uh, read you just by way of confirming my understanding of the history of what ended up happening with Yulia Timoshenko. I thought I would share this section of the, or at least some of this section of the Wikipedia entry on her 2011 trial <clears throat> and uh, give you some of the details just to help draw that parallel. In May of 2010... This is something. The Ukrainian Prosecutor General's Office, remember those guys? Started a number of criminal cases against Yulia Timoshenko, which prevented her from normal political activity. Hmm. And from international travel to her allies in the West. The European Parliament, that's of course the Parliament of the European Union, the European Parliament passed a resolution condemning Yanukovych's government for persecution of Timoshenko, as well as for prosecution in the gas case and other cases against her and her ministers. So it was the position of the European community that the corruption charges were bogus, essentially. And on June 24th, 2011, a trial started in the gas case concerning a contract signed in 2009 with Russian gas company Gazprom, you remember this, to supply natural gas to Ukraine. Timoshenko was charged with abuse of power and embezzlement as the court found the deal anti-economic for the country <laughs> and abusive. So, in other words, that it was somehow um, uh, exploitative and uh, was like, I don't know, it was embezzling, it was skimming money uh, from government sources in this deal. Timoshenko's trial, she was charged in May of 2011 for abuse of office concerned, uh, concerning natural gas imports um, started on June 24th in 2011 in Kiev. A number of criminal cases were also opened against other former officials from the second Timoshenko government. According to Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych, those cases were indiscriminately made to fight corruption in Ukraine. I don't know if they meant indiscriminately, really, but okay. Former President Viktor Yushchenko testified against Timoshenko during the trial which he called, uh, I guess he called the trial, a normal judicial process. Okay. The trial against Timoshenko had been, has been referred to as selective justice and political persecution in statements by the U.S., Russia, United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, Spain, and other European countries, and in statements by the European Union, NATO, the European People's Party, and by human rights organizations such as Transparency International, Freedom House, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch. Is that enough? Following her conviction, 
Timoshenko remained under criminal investigation for 10 criminal acts. Ukrainian prosecutors have claimed Timoshenko committed even more criminal acts. In early July 2011, Ukrainian security services opened a new criminal investigation into alleged non-delivery of goods by United Energy Systems of Ukraine. Now, United Energy Systems of Ukraine was Timoshenko's own energy company that's, uh, <clears throat> that supplied gasoline as well as natural gas uh, all over Ukraine. And But check this out. So it's 2011, the Ukrainian security service is opening an investigation into non-delivery of goods that is alleged to have taken place in 1996 at this point. The non-delivery of goods by United Energy Systems of Ukraine to Russia uh, in the value of $405.5 million. The Ukrainian Security Service is the SBU. The SBU maintains that Russia may claim this sum to the state budget of Ukraine. And this criminal case was closed in Russia in December of 2005 due to the lapse of time. I guess they have a statute of limitations on this. But yet it was opened in 2000, it was closed in Russia in 2005, opened as an investigation in Ukraine as 2011 is the date. October 11th, 2011, the court found Timoshenko guilty of abuse of power, sentenced her to seven years in prison, banned her from seeking elective office during her imprisonment anyway, and ordered her to pay the state $188 million. She was convicted of exceeding her powers as prime minister by ordering Naftagaz to sign the gas deal with Russia in 2009. Timoshenko did appeal the sentence, which she compared, uh, well, maybe not greatest comparison in the world, but to Stalin's great terror. Uh, a 2001 criminal case on state funds embezzlement and tax evasion against Timoshenko was reopened also in October of 2011. November 2011, Ukrainian tax police resumed four criminal cases against Timoshenko. Charged for these cases on 10th of November in 2011, Timoshenko was rearrested while in prison man, uh, in December after a Ukrainian court ordered her indefinite arrest as part of the investigation of alleged tax evasion and theft of government funds from between 1996 and 2000. Uh, perpetrated by her company, <clears throat> allegedly United Energy Systems of Ukraine. Again, the European Union showed concern over this. Uh, 23rd December 2011, Timoshenko lost her appeal for her sentence for abuse of power. She and her lawyers had boycotted the ac appeal proceedings. That's a good way to lose. Claiming that the judicial system and justice are totally non-existent in Ukraine today. Timoshenko has lodged a complaint against the verdict at the European Court of Human Rights, which was given priority treatment by the court. So just to pause here for a second, this is the end, very end of 2011. She boycotts the proceedings in her own appeal, saying that the judicial system is <clears throat> rife with corruption and controlled from the top, right? I only point that out. I want to bring you back briefly just your recollection of the secretly recorded, uh, was it June 2016 conversation? Yes, uh, June between the uh, Republican leaders of the U.S. House of Representatives. You remember who was there, Paul Ryan, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise is there. Patrick McHenry is there. If I forgotten anybody, uh, they're in luck. I left them off the list here. You remember the, the heart of that conversation. And I, you remember, I've been exhorting you all to reread it. It's about Ukraine. But one of the very interesting points being made there is Ryan is going on and on with his colleagues, really dominating the conversation, about how much he's learned about what's going on in Ukraine and the reform in Ukrainian politics. And one of the things that he says they're most proud of and that he's most proud of on their behalf as well is the reform of the judicial system, that they had major constitutional reforms and that they, the, the new prime minister, the one who had just been there that day to tell Kevin McCarthy, that's how the whole conversation started, to tell Kevin McCarthy face to face what problems they were facing in Ukraine and how much 
how many uh, the, the strides that they had made in reform and anti-corruption efforts and westernization and that they were still facing uh, military attack uh, by Russia and political interference in their elections, et cetera, et cetera, that one of their great reforms that Ryan is so proud of is the establishment of an independent judiciary. <clears throat> so this is some five years or so after Timoshenko finds herself imprisoned by puppet courts under the then current, uh, you know, under uh, Ukraine's then government. And I'm already forgetting which of the very many uh, similarly named players was the president at the time <clears throat> in 2011, 2012. But that's what they're talking about, that there was an enormous problem and recognized internationally that the judiciary in Ukraine was controlled from the top and corrupt. <clears throat> so uh, where do we pick up uh, or leave off here? Uh, she's loses her appeal. She's imprisoned. At this point, the details, I think, are too many and superfluous, but she spends a considerable amount of time in prison here. She appeals again, uh, some discussion about how that goes, and uh, international reactions <clears throat> to the trial and the outcome. The gas case trial was viewed by many European and American organizations as a politically charged persecution that violates the law. Pardon me. Had to do an extreme throat clearing there and uh, only had the mute button kick in late. Sorry about that. It's uh, really getting in the way here. So gas case trial was basically viewed as a sham. The European Union and multiple international organizations see the conviction as justice being applied selectively under political motivation. In June 2012, the European Parliament established a special monitoring mission to Ukraine conducted by former European Parliament President Pat Cox and former Polish President Alexander, oh my goodness, Polish President, uh, Alexander Kwasniewski, it's my best guess. Politicians observed trials, repeatedly visited Timoshenko in custody, and conducted meetings with Ukraine's authorities regarding her release. The European Union shelved the European Union Association Agreement and deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the Ukrainian government over the issue. So they were already working on integrating Ukraine into the European Union at that point, and they suspended the negotiations. Why? Over the travesty of a trial held for Timoshenko. Uh, moving ahead to April of 2013, the European Court of Human Rights issued a judgment asserting that Ms. Timoshenko's pre-trial detention had been arbitrary, that the lawfulness of her detention had not been properly reviewed, and that she had no possibility to seek compensation for her unlawful deprivation of liberty. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has adopted resolutions on keeping political and criminal responsibility separate, in which former Prime Minister of Ukraine Yulia Timoshenko is recognized as a political prisoner the United States Senate passed two resolutions calling for the release from prison of former Prime Minister Timoshenko. The most recent, presented in the Senate in June of 2013, called for Timoshenko's release in light of the recent European Court of Human Rights ruling, it was adopted in November of 2013. An earlier resolution of 2012 uh, had passed condemning the politically motivated prosecution and imprisonment of Timoshenko. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe had another resolution in October of 2013. Uh, basically, what you're seeing here is uh, more or less unified Western reaction to her trial and imprisonment as being uh, over, uh, overtly political and uh, not in keeping with the, we the Westernized values that we thought Ukraine was possibly moving towards. Now, there's a, one extra section here I'll, I'll read before we get to the, the end of her trial and imprisonment. Uh, this section called Aftermath, Manafort Case. According to the September 2018 indictment in which Paul Manafort, 
confessed as part of a plea bargain with U.S. Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller. Manafort and his partner, Tony Podesta, yes, it does get problematic, brother of Hillary Clinton campaign manager John Podesta, helped the former Ukrainian president to conduct a media campaign in the West directed against Timoshenko in order to undermine the support for her by the administration of then U.S. President Barack Obama. Hmm. Mueller gave Tony Podesta and the Podesta Group, which includes Clinton campaign manager John Podesta, complete amnesty, including not prosecuting them for being unregistered agents of a foreign government. The campaign was designed to make Timoshenko look like a supporter of anti-Semitism. We remember this part, right? The indictment also states that in July of 2011, former U.S. journalist Alan Friedman sent Manafort a confidential six-page document entitled Ukraine, the Digital Roadmap, which contained a plan for destruction, quote, destruction of Timoshenko using video, articles, and social networks. Maybe I should read that. The plan included creating a website, posting on the Internet, and sending out emails to the target audience in Europe and the U.S. It was also proposed to edit the page of Yulia Timoshenko in Wikipedia, which poses a certain danger, yes, in order to emphasize the corruption and legal proceedings related to her. Wow. Well, there's more to the story, of course. In 2014, apparently she is released from prison following the 2014 Ukrainian Revolution. On 21st of February 2014, Parliament voted for her release in a 310 to 54 veto-proof vote. Uh, it says, goes on to say, to do so, the members of Parliament decriminalized the article on which Timoshenko was charged and brought it into compliance with Article 19 of the UN Convention Against Corruption. Right. So when they reformed themselves and brought themselves into compliance with the U.N. Convention Against Corruption, Timoshenko is sprung from prison. Hmm. That could enable immediate release. And I guess it did. And there's a weird writing here of Timoshenko through the corresponding court ruling. However, Viktor Yanukovych fled the country after massive violent clashes in Kiev. It killed more than 80 people without signing the bill into law. Well, did we really want him to sign it into law? Anyway, I guess that's why they say it could have released her immediately, but it didn't because the president didn't sign it because he was deposed in a revolution. On 22nd of February in 2014, the Ver Verkovna Rada, with 322 votes, is that the parliament there, adopted a decree based on the decision of the European Court of Human Rights and corresponding decision of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on the same day, Timoshenko was released, uh, as it happens, from Central Clinical Hospital Number no. 5, where she'd been really receiving treatment under police guard since May of 2012 after being diagnosed with a uh, spinal disc herniation. It's sort of neither here nor there. But anyway, February 28, 2014, the parliament rehabilitated Timoshenko and restored her rights. That enabled her to run for office. However, she then uh, ruled out uh, running for prime minister again. However, she later ran for president and her political activities since her release uh, has included at least one more presidential run uh, as well as, I guess, some more parliamentary activity if you skim down a little bit further. Anyway, uh, here we can finally, I think, wrap up the Timoshenko discussion by uh, just pointing out that uh, it, it's a remarkable parallel and reminder that uh, Dmitry Firtash lurks beneath all of this. He is the, mm, I guess, the, 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 the uh, individual with the greatest personal interest in the middleman gas dealer that gets cut out of the deal that Timoshenko cuts directly with Russia. So billions of dollars are taken out of his pocket. <clears throat> he knows Manafort. Manafort works to elect a new government and defeat her in the presidential election in Ukraine, but doesn't stop there. It's not enough to defeat her in the election. He has to, you know where I'm going with this, three words, right? Lock her up. Hmm. What an amazing parallel. Not only 
does Manafort come away from the uh, early part of this decade, the 2010, 2011, 12 period, with the idea that it's a, not only a legitimate but doable political tactic, beat your political rival in the presidential election and then lock her up. But he also comes away with this other idea that you can successfully use the apparatus of state in Ukraine, despite all their efforts at or on all their claims about having reformed, it might still be possible to convince the president of Ukraine to use the levers of government to trump up corruption charges over natural gas deals to tar political rivals and put them in enough legal jeopardy that they spend years in prison. Hmm. Who would uh, think that anything bad could come about? Certainly nothing can go wrong from there, right? What could go wrong? We'll just leave it there. Okay. I thought that was important background, and it takes us far, far away from the breaking news of the day, to be sure. But uh, it's my suspicion that you have all read up on what happened over the weekend and had your reactions to it. That doesn't mean we aren't going to double back and discuss it. I just thought, well, maybe a little value added here for a Monday and give you a historical background that might just, like our other theory about what was driving the call to the Ukrainian president, break out as the uh, rising or dominant narrative for explaining what the hell happened in this political debacle. Because we're still wondering, still scratching our heads over that one. Okay, let's see. I'll move on for the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank Eric Postman for having sent us um, our newest snippet on the Senate. And as a matter of fact, maybe what I'll do is, uh, it's a it's a hard, weird transition, and I should have done this earlier because I, I forgot which state it was that he covered. He He's talking about the main Senate race, and that was our first topic of discussion. So why don't we bring it back around while I still have the time and play Eric's piece here. It would have been a great thing to uh, uh, use tomorrow, but because Maine was on our minds earlier, let's let's end with Maine, too. Good morning, David. It's Eric in Orlando here once again to remind your listeners of the absolutely vital task at hand in 2020 to retake the Senate. Sure, everybody is buzzing about impeachment investigations and Democratic horse race polls, but let's not lose sight of the crucial battle for the upper chamber. Imagine in your mind's eye if President Warren takes over in January 2021 without dispute in a relatively normal transfer of power. But then she can't get any cabinet secretaries confirmed, balance out all the McConnell judges, or pass any progressive legislation, all because Democrats poured everything into the presidential race and couldn't achieve a three-seat flip in the Senate. As recent electoral outcomes would tell us, anything is possible, which is why it's so important to examine every race and shine a light on every possible flippable seat. This is the Senate Snippet Series, Volume 3. Our first essay focused on South Carolina, where Lindsey Graham will no doubt face his toughest general election battle of his career, against progressive challenger Jamie Harrison, provided some compromise doesn't force him to resign in scandal first. Then we took a look at Montana, which isn't as red a state as everyone thinks, and the senator that's up for re-election there, Steve Daines, likely has a Q rating as low as any elected official in Washington. Today we take a look at a target that's definitely in the DSCC top three, Maine, where Susan Collins is likely deeply concerned about her 2020 chances, as she should be. Maine, with all respect to Bill from Portland, is weird. The state that voted Paula Page as its governor twice saw one of their congressional districts vote for Trump in 2016, giving him one of the state's four electoral votes. Senator Collins fits the mold of the flinty New England gop -er, who brings a dignified above the fray persona, willing to buck their own party to achieve the common good. Think Lowell Weicker, Bill Weld, Olympia Snow. Even the progressives in this area of the country take on independent leanings. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders identifies as independent, as does the other Maine senator and former governor, Angus King. But where Susan Collins may once have seemed iconoclast, now she just seems wishy-washy. She famously voted against the confirmation of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos and against the Trump administration's attempts to overturn the ACA, 
as she continued to define herself as a pro-choice Republican. But then she voted to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, a move that undermines all that, and also triggered huge campaign donations to both re-elect her and to defeat her. Is Collins an independent legislative voice or simply another Republican hack? Is she more afraid of a primary challenger or looking too partisan in a general election? She probably doesn't even know the answer to that. What we do know is that the old rules no longer apply. There was a thought Collins would resign her Senate seat to run for governor in 2018, but she could likely read the writing on the wall in a blue wave year. And the race was won by Democrat Janet Mills. Collins' only real chance to secure her re-election in 2020 was probably to go full Arlen Specter and switch sides once Trump was inaugurated. But considering that she votes with Trump 68% of the time, that may not have been very realistic. Now the four-term incumbent has made her bed and the challenges are all lining up. After former Obama UN Ambassador and National Security Advisor Susan Rice briefly flirted with the idea of a Senate challenge, that was quickly scuttled on Twitter after a couple of days. The front runner now is Sarah Gideon, the Speaker of Maine's House of Representatives. In fact, if you go to Wikipedia and type in Maine Senate Race 2020, the first two items that come up are Sarah Gideon for Senate, defeat Susan Collins, put Maine first, and Susan Collins took $5 million from corporate donors. Sarah Gideon is 47 and a mother of three. Her campaign is very active on social media, and she continues to hammer away at Collins on her votes for the Trump tax bill and on Kavanaugh. That Collins is far more aligned with corporate interests than the citizens of Maine. She's not wrong. The Cook Political Report rates this race as a toss-up, but you'd have to think the political winds will be pushing it in the Democrats' favor as we approach one year out. But Collins does have one card left to play. If the House impeaches Trump, she could go against her own party, with McConnell knowing that she'd be one of the only Republicans to do so, and keeping the vote well under two-thirds of the need to convict. That's assuming McConnell even calls a vote, and it would seem highly dubious that Trump would accept such a practical political move from Collins, and would likely flame her out with the base anyway. So there don't seem to be any right moves for Collins to make. She'll just have to rely on even more corporate donations and the equity and name value that she's earned, having been elected to the U.S. Senate four times before. To me, Collins seems like a lame duck. But just to be sure, I have donated to SarahGideon.com because I'm an anxious activist doing a Senate snippet series, and I don't live in Maine. Back to the show. All right. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. And uh, good bookends for this to start and finish with Maine, I think. Uh, plenty more to catch up on, of course, but we're out of time for the day. And so I will note only uh, in passing, I guess, one more note about the weirdness of having uh, Lev Parnas involved in all of this. Uh, somebody did point out over the weekend, good point, I thought, um, for a guy who's a major league political donor and giving half a million dollars to Trump super PACs, et cetera, et cetera, and playing in these circles and showing up at George H.W. Bush's uh, funeral, etc. What kind of person who can move in those circles picks up side work as translators for Joe, Joe DeGeneva and Victoria Tensing in their work for Dimitri Firtash? It seems like an odd thing to be spending your time with if you have access to that kind of capital already, even if you're actually only just stealing it along the way. It just seems like uh, something of an oddity. And as a matter of fact, it strikes me, I want to throw this theory out there before we find out that this is true too. It sounds more and more to me like this is just a great way to smuggle a Ukrainian mobster in for a meeting with Dmitry Firtash while he's under house arrest in Vienna and do it in a way that if the, uh, if the Austrian authorities have no idea who he is, they don't interrupt and you can pass messages now in between Firtash and whoever else uh, he might be in contact with on the outside and uh, coordinate your strategy with, for dealing with uh, both the exploding Ukraine scandal and everything else along the way. So, yeah, uh, we may find out that that ends up being more like what's going on than the idea of him providing translation services. I mean, lots of people speak Ukrainian. What do you need Lev Parnas for in all of this? All right. 
We got that to catch up on. We got more Trump paperwork that turned out not to be true with respect to uh, China and the trade deal that we can catch up on. I'll share that uh, tweet with you, a new scoop from Jenny Leonard who says... Uh, China isn't ready to sign what Trump has been calling a phase one deal without more talks later this month. What do you know? Uh, uh, once again, the paperwork is not ready for prime time or any other time for that matter. Stay tuned now for Justice Putnam and the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. He'll round up all these other stories that we put aside to give you the backgrounder on Yulia Tymoshenko. I hope that turns out to be worth it. What's he got? Ah, well, look, Ukrainian, uh, former Ukrainian ambassador or ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, was removed from her post, as it turns out, because she was an obstacle to the corrupt shadow foreign policy that Trump and his bagman Giuliani cooked up. On the rest of the menu, the federal judge blocked the Trump administration from denying green cards to poor immigrants. A Trump appointed judge claimed Congress can't investigate a president installed by a hostile foreign power before impeachment, but a majority of the court disagreed with her. And Trump officials want to gut the White House foreign policy staff by 50%. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. I mean, what a time for that. Why gut it by 50%? Well, that's so that Trump's phone calls are no longer impeded by stupid things like the Constitution and the rule of law. International news out there as well, as always. Don't know if I can really wrap them all up, but I see the name of uh, retired appeals court judge, Judge Marion Trump Barry, in the news too. Stay tuned.